Now you see here, this is a low-end Rolex. Basic. A classic. Runs you about five grand. Now there are models that go up from there. But for a really good Rolex, you're looking to spend upward to 15 to 100,000 bucks. I was getting a lesson in fancy watches in my North Park Alley apartment from a guy living on my couch <laughs> when a garage truck rolled by. His name was Paul. My boyfriend at the time, Brent, met Paul at the methadone clinic. Brent attracted all sorts of nefarious characters and added them to his collection like he was writing a Bukowski novel. <laughs> Brent and I had been together for a few years. He sported that black slicked back hair, lots of black band t-shirts, black converse. He had maintained that look since he was 15. <laughs> As for me, I was still going through my boys trying to be men who were covered in regrettable tattoos, tangled up in hardcore drug addiction phase. <laughs> I would eventually grow out of that. Paul drove an old convertible, ooh, an old convertible BMW. He was tall, handsome, tan, yet a little gaunt, always clean shaven. He had neatly trimmed hair. He kind of resembled the preppy bad guy in the 80s movies. <laughs> he was 45, but could e easily pass for 35. Heroin has a way of preserving you, like pickling juice. He wore chinos and expensive polo shirts. He always had like a Canon or a Nikon around his neck and a Rolex on his wrist. Once I asked him why he loved taking pictures. Are you kidding me? This thing doesn't even have film in it. <laughs> it's expensive. Makes me look rich. His look was his grift. Paul had grown up in La Jolla a rich kid in the 80s. His mom and dad owned a jewelry store right in La Jolla Village, passing down an impressive knowledge of diamonds and gemstones. Paul had started doing drugs in high school. Just a smattering of the light stuff, crack, PCP, and heroin. <laughs> As an adult, he had served five years of a 10-year sentence for stealing TVs and electronics from Best Buy. Hit, Paul and his associates would steal rolls of branded Best Buy receipts, print out fake sales tickets for TVs and stereos, pick them up in the loading dock and resell them. He had to rent a warehouse to store all of his stolen goods. <laughs> <laughs> he said he made millions. When the judge sentenced him, Paul told us he collapsed to his knees and cried. Poor little rich boy. Paul was filled with delightful stories like this like when he tried to buy crack in Sherman Heights in the 80s. He was a white boy in his mom's white Porsche, tan Palomino leather interior. <laughs> 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 the drug dealer tried to steal his car, obviously. And when Paul wouldn't get out, the guy shot him. <laughs> 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 Paul drove to the hospital, bleeding all over that fine leather interior crashed into the emergency room entrance. He was 17 years old. I hope it goes without saying that I completely worshipped this man. <laughs> <laughs> and I think my boyfriend admired him too. And that's why when Paul's girlfriend kicked him out, we offered him our couch. No questions asked because a 45-year-old man moving in with kids in their early 20s is perfectly normal. <laughs> I remember shortly after we gained a new roommate, I went into Paul's backpack looking for a cigarette but found a gun instead. <laughs> I had never seen a gun before. And like an idiot, I thought that was cool. A slick criminal. Paul was a total gentleman. He would bring me Prada sunglasses and designer clothes. He knew my jean size, it's impressive. He once bought me a gold leather biker jacket for a 24 year old, I mean, Jesus Christ. Um, he did dishes, he bought groceries, he vacuumed, he scrubbed the toilet. I mean, I don't know if these habits come with age 
or they're formed in prison. <laughs> um, and he lived with us for months. We did hard drugs and wore designer clothes. I had a normal office job, all pencil skirts and cardigans. I paid the rent and utilities. Paul and Brent would run errands during the day and keep us stocked in other supplies. We were an oddly functional family with a crack-smoking, gun-toting, Rolex-wearing patriarch running the show. <laughs> it was around Christmas time when this all came crashing down. I woke up one morning and Brent was missing. I peeked my head out of the bedroom. Paul was asleep on the couch. Brent's gone. Did you see him leave? Paul shook his head. We waited for a few hours and finally got a call from the San Diego County Jail. Brent had tried to steal DVDs from Vons at 5 a.m. in a clonopin-induced klepto frenzy. <laughs> Obviously, stealing DVDs from Vons requires two people. <laughs> One person would grab a basket, load it up with DVDs, throw a roll of tinfoil, and then a large bag of chips on top to hide the DVDs. And then you take the basket into the bathroom and you throw everything into the trash can and then you leave Vons. <laughs> <laughs> then the second person goes into the store with a backpack on and goes straight into the bathroom. <laughs> you take the tin foil and wrap the DVDs up and then you put them in your backpack and then you leave and then the sensors don't go off. Therefore, the first person <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> Therefore, the first person seen on the surveillance video with the DVDs wasn't really stealing them. They were just leaving the store empty-handed. The second person was the one with the goods, and they were only seen on camera going to the bathroom and leaving. This was Brent's small-time grift one that required two people. <sighs> it did not work as a solo mission. <sighs> oh, and by the way, back in the early 2000s, drug dealers accepted DVDs in exchange for drugs, <laughs> especially Disney movies for their kids. <laughs> Wholesome stuff. Brent doesn't remember driving or loading up his backpack or running out. The security guard had to tackle him to the ground. He only made it two blocks. His face was scraped up. He broke his glasses. All over three copies of Die Hard 2 and The Little Mermaid. <laughs> Core memory created. Nothing is sadder than walking through Horton Plaza after work with the Charlie Brown Christmas song playing and having to visit your boyfriend in jail. <laughs> Brent looked like shit. <laughs> His hands were shaking. Methadone detox was hitting him hard. For some reason, his bail was really high, perhaps due to his repeat offenses. The drugged up wrestling match with the rent-a-cop. Maybe it was because it was the holidays. I was told he wouldn't be let out until after Christmas unless I could make a $10,000 bail. This was a figure I could not comprehend. $10,000? Lucky for me, the fine gentleman at All Pro Bales Bondsman broke it down. <laughs> side, side note, people that work at bail bondsman's offices are the nicest people <laughs> in the universe. <laughs> I was gifted a bottle of water, a cup of coffee, and not one, but two all pro bail bondsmen's t-shirts. <laughs> Surprised by their kindness as I sipped shitty coffee through tears. Did you know you're only required to pay 10% of a bail total? <laughs> the other 90% is waived upon the return to a court date. So $1,000. It could have been a million. Little 24-year-old me did not have that kind of money. But this is why God invented bail bondsmen. I would just need to come up with $500, and the rest I could refinance and pay back monthly at a double-digit interest rate. <laughs> Credit score be damned. So $500 could have been a million. Again, little 24-year-old me was overdraft bank fee club and did not have that kind of cash. 
And that is where the elegant thief, my very own sweet Paul, came up with the solution. A couple months before the Clonopin DVD debacle, Paul had stolen a Segway. <laughs> you know, the two-wheeled, one-manned answer to modern transportation? <laughs> he just rode that thing right off the dealership lot. <laughs> Whizzed that nerdy contraption down the street a few miles and into his friend's garage, and that's where it stayed. Paul offered me the opportunity to sell this stolen Segway. Paul was terrible with computers as anyone who shared his history of hefty jail time. Hell, it could have been generational. All he needed was a well-written Craigslist ad and a pretty, trustworthy face. <laughs> he would give me $500 from the transaction, and I could bail out my sweaty, crusty, detoxing dirt bag all before Christmas. So I posted, Segway for sale. <laughs> the people mover. Slightly used Segway for sale. Practically new. Runs great. I just never got around to writing it. <laughs> this is the transportation of the future. $2,500 or best offer. I got a call within an hour. Our savior showed up later that evening. He was chubby with glasses. Definitely clocked in a few hours with a 20-sided die during a few D&D &D campaigns. <laughs> we met in the alley behind our apartment, and as much as I wanted to think Paul and I looked professional, this transaction was sketchy as hell. I asked him why he wanted a segue, making small talk, assuring him the sale was on the level. His, friend, his friends were starting a segue club to ride around San Diego basically a nerdy biker gang. Paul showed him how it worked, both of them taking turns whizzing up and down the alley. I kept my cool. This is the first person who called, the first person to show up. How much for it again? 2,500, I said sweetly, employing all the charm. And to our relief, he didn't hesitate or haggle. He handed me an envelope heavy with $20 bills. A Christmas miracle. <laughs> when Paul and I got to the apartment, he handed me $200. My elegant con man was trying to con. He couldn't help it. I sounded like a spoiled kid. Paul, you said 500. I need 500. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot. Fucking junkies, man. We took the 11 bus from North Park to downtown. It was dark. After paying the bondsman, we still had to wait a few hours before Brent's release. It was about midnight. Paul and I passed the time drinking beers at one of those touristy nightclubs on Fifth Avenue, toasting to what a great pair of criminals we made. <laughs> and it was true. It was all about appearances. He told me I was dangerous and sweet and charming and beautiful. He bought me drinks and told me I could run this world. I imagined diamond heists and bank vaults and fake passports and jet planes and pink mansions and fast cards and I could leave fucking Brent and this idiotic DVD heist behind me. <laughs> ah, but we had to kick Paul out after New Year's. Surprisingly, his crack habit got out of control. <laughs> He would sit in the front window, peeking out the blinds, gun on his lap, and wouldn't let us leave the house until he decided they weren't watching. <laughs> the house was disgusting, the expensive gifts stopped coming, and I couldn't keep up. My body started shutting down. Veins disappeared. I grew resentful of the lying and the daily struggle, and I started to see how years would pass and we would just become those stupid fucking junkies. A few months later, I heard Paul was picked up by the cops. They arrested him for breaking into houses through open garage doors and multiple retail thefts. One piece of evidence was some random surveillance video of a sharp-dressed man 
effortlessly <laughs> riding a Segway off a dealership lot. <laughs> Rolex glinting in the sun. Thank you. <laughs>